All right, you guys, um, I am here today to uh, pick up where we left off last week re and record the lecture that I didn't get to give last night because of the holiday. So I believe we started off, left off, pardon me, in um, right at this point, which is where I wanted to start talking about the electrophysiology of the heart. So why we're talking about this here is because we are going to have a conversation about dysrhythmias or arrhythmias. And um, in order to have that conversation, we have to at least refresh our memory in terms of the electrical physiology of the heart. And I'm sure you guys have have learned this somewhere, and this can be kind of complicated, and I don't want to really get too carried away with it, but um, I'll, I'll start by saying that when we have a dysrhythmia, we have an alteration in the normal either generation or conduction of electrical impulses or ac action potentials across the myocardium in this case because we're talking about the heart. So if you remember, action potentials can occur in neurons. They also occur in mus cardiac muscle cells, which we call myocytes. And they will occur because of changes in the concentration of ions found right inside and right outside of the cell. So under resting conditions, when a cell is not stimulated or a neuron, a myocyte is not stimulated or a, or a neuron is not stimulated, um, what the setup of the ions is, is the sodium ions and the calcium ions are in higher concentration outside of the cell and the myocytes and the potassium ions are in higher concentration inside of the cell. And this imbalance with the positively charged sodium and potassium outside of the cell and the positive and this positively charged potassium inside of the cell um, imparts a slightly negative charge to the plasma membrane. So the inside is a little more negative relative to the outside. And that's the same in, in, in neurons. Um, the only real difference in neurons is we don't really factor in the calcium. So an action potential um, occurs when a neuron or a myocyte is stimulated to threshold and you know we go through the phases of the action potential, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And again, I, I'm just really doing this for review um, in terms of what you're going to be required in terms of testing. We'll talk a little bit about the dysrhythmias or the arrhythmias, but in order to understand those, you kind of have to have at least a, a working knowledge of what's going on electrically. So on the top, you see um, the ve ventricular action potential, and then on the bottom, you see an ECG tracing. So I'm sure in physiology you, re you learned this, whether or not you remember it. Chances are we don't remember, you don't remember all of it because it's sort of hard to keep all this in your mind. But basically there's four phases. Phase, um, now on this picture, start with phase four, which is kind of the easiest to start with because in phase four, the um, myocyte is resting. It's during its resting phase, followed by phase zero, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So I'm just going to run you through them really quickly. Again, just really for background knowledge. So phase four, it's like I said, it's the easiest one to start with. It's beca because it's when the myocyte or the cardiac muscle cell is resting and there's no action a potential occurring at this point. Um, so what is happening during phase four is the membrane potential is slowly increasing towards um, a potential that will trigger an action potential. And so if you remember, in order for an action potential to be triggered, you've got to reach a threshold. So the threshold potential is what we're talking about here. And the heart cells, are the, in the heart, this is a little, bit, um, a little bit different than in a neuron because what's happening is sodium is slowly leaking into the cell during this period. And um, that's causing a change in the membrane potential. So it gives certain regions, specifically the SA node, the because that's where this where we have a lot of sodium leaking. It gives the SA node um, the property which we refer to as automaticity, and that will show up on a slide in a minute. But that's basically the ability to spontaneously depolarize without input from the nervous system, and that's unique to the heart. All right, so then we have phase zero. So essentially in phase zero, so phase zero is where we kind of see that, that, that steep climb in the picture there. Let me get my right here, phase zero. All right, so 
what's happening here is an action potential is beginning when the threshold potential is reached and this is essentially due to the gated sodium ion channels that are located on the plasma membrane become activated and they open. Sodium then pours into the cell and it causes this rapid depolarization, which is you see why it spikes so quickly. And also, when we have this rapid depolarization, we lose our membrane potential. All right, so the sodium channels open and close rapidly. And for that reason, sometimes they're referred to as fast channels. I've always found the fast and slow a little bit confusing in terms of terminology. But the reason why they're called fast is because they open and close quickly. So during this period, phase zero, calcium also starts entering into the cell. And um, it's entering through calcium ion channels. The influx of calcium is a lot slower than the influx of sodium. And um, and again, like I said, the the location where we're really seeing this, <coughs> excuse me, is in the SA node and the AV node. So in 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 the SA node and the AV node, um, the influx of calcium, it it is I should say the influx of calcium, um, rather than the influx of sodium, which really generates that rapid membrane depolarization in the at that location of the SA node and the AV node specifically. So it's kind of confusing because there's um, lots of different sort of electrical, th there's some, some variation in what's going on electrically depending on the locations. So the, so the calcium really plays, I guess what we should say, the calcium influx really plays a significant role it, at the location of the SA node and the AV node. So then we get to the top there, right here, this part, and that's called phase one. And really, the only thing that's happening in phase one is we're still depolarizing, but now the inside of the plasma membrane um, tempor temporarily um, reverses its charge, and it becomes positive. So this is like a, what we re would refer to, and and it's I think this in this picture it looks like even a little bit elongated. Um, it's kind of a transient phase. And then we go into what we'll refer to as the plateau phase, which is which is phase two. And again, in this picture, um, it looks a little. Uh, in it, I think we could we could make this a little bit better and make that phase two just a tiny bit more flat. So during phase two, the plateau phase, um, the depolarization basically is maintained, and calcium channels are cal calcium ions. Pardon me, are entering into the cell. And um, that's going to signal an additional release of calcium ions that are held in the storage inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, if you remember from muscles, your anatomy of muscles. And then this kind of surge, this large and sudden increase in intracellular calcium, ultimately is what's responsible for the contraction of the cardiac muscle. And of course, we know that calcium plays a very important role in muscle contraction. The other thing that's happening in phase two is gated potassium channels are opening, causing an efflux or an exit of potassium from the cells. So the plateau is maintained so long as the potassium, uh, positive calcium ions, pardon me, are entering and are balanced by the positive potassium ions leaving. And that what's, that's what maintains that kind of flatness of the plateau phase. Um, we don't see that plateau phase in skeletal muscle. This is not something that happens because because we don't have, the, the calcium doesn't play the role. And so instead, just potassium leaves, so you go down. But in cardiac muscle, you see the, that plateau phase. And then we've got phase three. So we're going down now, phase three. Um, calcium ca channels are gonna close. P more potassium channels are gonna open. And this is gonna cause a net loss of positive potassium ions from the cell. So we're calling this the repolarization phase. And we're going to continue to repolarize um, until we return to that negative resting membrane potential. And then you see we're back at phase four, which is when we're resting. Um, so the synchronicity of the pumping or the synchronized action, if you could say, of the pumping of the heart requires, of course, alternating periods of contraction and relaxation.
And so there is, and this will show up on a slide in a minute, but since we're looking at the picture right now, there is a brief period of time following the depolarization and most of the repolarization, like the top maybe like, you know, like two thirds of repolarization, um, that you cannot, that the cell cannot initiate another action potential. And this is called the refractory period. And in, in, cardi in cardiac physiology, we refer to the refractory period as either being absolute or relative. I'm in an absolute refractory period. There's no way you can stimulate a, another contraction. In relative refractory, um, you can, but the stimulus has to be pretty strong. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So hopefully that was a, an SF. Uh, sort of a review and again um, oh here's another picture this is a better one um, so here we have the what's happening in the atria ventricular atria ventricular atrial cells pardon me ventricular cells and the Purkinje fibers versus what's going on in the AV node and the and the SA node and the AV node and remember the SA node and the AV node that's where we have this this what really what stimulates the the the, the threshold and ultimately the the depolarization is that slow influx of um, of calcium so this kind of slow leak of calcium all right so again the term automaticity I just said it but here you can see it on the slide automaticity you, you could say is the capacity for spontaneous and repetitive self depolarization um, um, so it basically means that, that the cardiac muscle cells can be stimulated without, without the nervous system, without impulse. So they, they, deep, they spontaneously depolarize without the input from the nervous system. Not to say that the nervous system doesn't affect the rate and or rhythm of the heart, mostly rate, um, but it is not reliant on the nervous system, I think is the important thing. All right, so um, again, there's your SA node and the AV node, and the and the way that it that depolarizes is, you know, the electrical system of the heart depolarizes is this slow influx of um, sodium and calcium. It's kind of like I, I believe in physiology, you may have learned about the um, channels at the nodal tissue as leaky leaky channels, um, and that that just means they're sort of slowly leaking. Um, calcium primarily into the cell the myocyte and um and that that slow kind of drift up towards threshold in sort of a rhythmic fashion is what we refer to as the pacemaker potential you know and it's the it's the current that opens the sodium channels essentially so as i said the um the nervous system, the heart, the contraction of the heart isn't necessarily reliant on the nervous system, but it can very definitely be affected, and so by the nervous system and or hormones. And so one thing that's good to remember is that both the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node um, both have receptors, sympathetic and um, and parasympathetic receptors. So the beta-1 adrenergic receptors are the ones that respond to norepinephrine or epinephrine, and the muscarinic cholinergic receptors respond to acetylcholine. So um, when we see adrenergic stimulation, we'll see an increase in the background influx of sodium and potassium, which basically means it's gonna reach threshold faster, which is gonna increase the rate of the pacemaker current, increasing, consequently increasing heart rate. The parasympathetic, driven primarily by the vagus nerve, um, when we see vagal stimulation, what we're going to see instead is an increase in the potassium efflux, which is going to hyperpolarize the cells and slow down, take it long, that cell longer to reach threshold, which will ultimately slow down the rate of the heart. So here's our um, term refractory period that I just mentioned. So the refractory period, kind of in the most basic sense of the term, is the time when the heart may not be stimulated to beat again. So there's a couple things that are interesting to note, you know, um, and, and to sort of not necessarily ha has to do with refractory, but they kind of go together. One thing to know is that the AV node, which is the, the 
so we go the SA node to the AV node, as you know, and then we go from the AV node to the bundle, which dives through that um, fiber skeleton of the heart and basically electrically connects the um, atria to the ventricles. So the AV node is turns out is limited to about 200 beats per minute, which means if the atria is stimulate is driving um, more than 200 beats per minute, it's got there. It's going to get blocked, if you will. It's sort of a loose use of the term, but it's going to get blocked um, at the AV node. And so what will happen then is the atria are basically in fibril in flutter. They're moving really fast. And the ventricles are, it, we're not going to throw all those beats to the ventricles. That would be way too fast, right? That's, it's not, that's not a heart rate that we can s sustain. Um, you know, normal heart rate is, resting heart rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So a sustained heart rate of 200 beats per minute isn't, is not going to be, isn't workable because it so significantly shortens the filling phase. Right? So your heart's beating fast, but you're not filling because you're not ever really relaxing, which is when, when the heart is in, re in diastole, ventricles are in diastole, that's when they're refilling. So sometimes when this is happening, so basically your, your, your heart is not, electrically is not performing in the way it needs to. And so this is one of the reasons why they'll um, use electroshock. So electroshock basically kind of electrically neutralizes so it basically neutralizes all activity all electrical pardon me activity in the hopes that the um heart will will pick back up again with a normal sinus rhythm that would be ideal um so when their beat is being is being generated in some place other than the pacemaker or the sa node we call that that an ectopic beat so ectopic beats or an ectopic focus um, is any place that's that's basically generating an action potential in the heart outside of the SA node. And so sometimes that's a really good thing. So in the case, like we were just talking about above, where you've got your atria generating 200 beats per minute and getting blocked at the ventricles, because the, any place in the conduction system can spontaneously depolarize, the ventricles can spontaneously generate a contraction, right? Anywhere in the bundle branches, more likely in this case, it would be the Purkinje fibers. And so if the ventricles beat out of, out of order, you know, in terms of the way that the electrical activity generally is transmitted, we would call that an escape beat. And escape beats can be a really helpful thing, right? If you're not getting the message from the atria to the ventricles, you need to get some blood out of the heart. And so the escape, escape beats can be very effective there. Um, there's, an, there's another um, dysrhythmia that is called uh, a reentry abnormality, or sometimes it's called um, a circus movement. I think reentry abnormality makes a little bit more sense. And so I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, um, and and I'll sh and it'll hopefully help to illustrate the reentry abnormality. <clears throat> um, another situation where we might want to use, a, and sometimes they'll use electroshock for reentry abnormalities, basically because the the heart kind of gets stuck in a loop. And basically, what we're trying to do when you have a, a, an electrical abnormality. Um, the use of electroshock is, again, to sort of cancel out all electrical activity and hope that the heart kind of picks back up again the way it's supposed to with the SA node, AV node, you know, and down the line. Um, one other situation where we may see the use of electroshock would be when we have a, a dysrhythmia referred to as um, fibrillation. And so fibrillation is the fastest and most dangerous of the dysrhythmias. And it's be, it, what happens in fibrillation is the cells are firing individually, but we're not seeing a unified beat. So you're not getting a unified contraction, which means essentially, especially in the ventricles, when you're not getting unified contraction, you're not ever going to generate enough pressure to get the heart to eject the blood. So that's a very ventricular fibrillation is the most dangerous um, arrhythmia of the ventricles for sure. So this is sort of a weird picture, but 
Um, it's abnormal. You can tell right away that, that that's very abnormal. Um, but what you're seeing here is you're seeing some escape beats. So escape beats, again, are generated in the ventricles in this case because the H is, you know, you see, so the, the vector is flowing in a direction that we're not oftentimes accustomed to looking at if you've just seen EKGs a couple times. So this part isn't really abnormal. So this is your QRS complex, right? It's just that particular lead is reading the electrical activity in a way that deflects the QRS complex below um, below the line rather than, sorry, um, above. But this is a, an escape beat. Escape beats tend to be lower, not quite as high, and wider. And oftentimes they have that little spiky, the little spiky thing right there. And you can tell that the electrical activity is going in the opposite direction of the rest of the electrical activity of the heart. So that's an escape beat there. There's another one at the end. So again, that allows for some blood to get out of the heart, but it's not an effective, it's not an effective fix. Okay, so re-entry abnormality. This is a kind of, com this is a common um, dysrhythmia, and it is a, it requires a, simple, a couple criterion to be met. One is that first for it to occur, so essentially what's happening with re with reentry is the same impulse is reactivating tissue that's already been stimulated. And so that doesn't generally happen because of refraction, right? You stimulate tissue and then it goes into refraction. So you can't stimulate that tissue again. But if you slow the conduction down so much that the, the tissue is out of refraction by the time the, the while that current is still circulating in the heart, that can cause a re-entry abnormality. The other thing that can happen is the refractory period can be shortened significantly, or in many cases, both of these things are co coexisting. So you have very, sh you have really slow conduction and the refractory period is shortened. And again, remember that the refractory period is the period in which you should not be able to stimulate that heart to beat again. So this is kind of, this is the way that we always draw, that all textbooks draw ref the reentry abnormality. And I will say that um, one of the reasons why this particular problem is so common is because it oftentimes happens in people who have had or presents in people who have had a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. And so what a myocardial infarction is, is it's basically an area of dead tissue, right? The tissue has be an area of necrosis in the heart. So some cells have died. And it, it turns out that when you have cells that have died in the heart, they don't conduct um, impulses effectively. They, they serve as what we refer to as a unidirectional block, meaning they that when an impulse hits, kind of directly hits that dead tissue, it blocks it. But it can be, it can be um, stimulated sort of through the back door, around the backside. So what you're seeing here, this is they, when they draw this, they're sort of illustrating ventricular, a, ventr a ventricular cell, a, myoci a myocyte in the ventricle. <clears throat> And so you start with A, the impulse is coming through the cell, which normally, you know, they spread through cells quickly through the intercalated discs between cells. And um, so then it gets to that bifurcation and it splits and it gets blocked at the unidirectional block at that, that area that's black and white striped, that's necrotic tissue. So the, so the impulse gets blocked there. And so instead it continues the other way and it just keeps spreading, but it comes back around and it hits from the backside, that area of dead tissue, and it essentially re-stimulates that entire cell again, right? Because either the, sl the conduction has been so slowed that by the time it gets all the way around again, the tissue ab above the unidirectional block is out of refraction. So it can be hit again, and then it's just gonna depolarize because that's what happens, that's how it, that's how it works. So that's called a refractory, a re-entry abnormality, pardon me, or sometimes I refer to it as a circus movement, but I think a re-entry makes a little bit more sense. So that same impulse just keeps circling. So it will cause what we would refer to as a, pre a premature beat in most cases. Okay. So I'm going to stop this video in bits and pieces so you guys can take it in chunks. So I'm going to stop this one here and I'll pick up the next with the cardiac cycle.